Hello, my name is Dr. Arthur Menezes and I'm a third year internal medicine resident at Auctioner Clinic Foundation in New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm here to briefly talk about our paper titled Atrial Fibrillation in the 21st Century, a current understanding of risk factors and primary prevention strategies. That's going to be published in the April 2013 issue of the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Before I proceed, I would first like to thank all my co-authors on this, on this paper, especially my mentor, Dr. Carl J. Levy, better known as Dr. Chip Levy. Now, atrial fibrillation is the most common arrhythmia worldwide and has a significant impact on morbidity and mortality. Currently, atrial fibrillation affects approximately 2.3 million adults in the United States, and this number is actually projected to increase from anywhere between 5.6 million to 15.9 million by the year 2050. Over the decades, our understanding of this condition has evolved significantly. However, it should be known that there is much still unknown about the etiology and pathophysiology. As a result, apart from general cardiology risk factor prevention goals, there are no current primary prevention strategies in place, despite the enormous impact on morbidity and mortality associated with this condition. It was the goal of this paper to provide an overview of established risk factors for atrial fibrillation, as well as discuss newer proposed risk factors. And based on these risk factors, we wanted to discuss potential primary prevention strategies that may potentially decrease the risk of atrial fibrillation. Now, metabolic syndrome consists of a group of risk factors that have been shown to be associated with a higher risk of developing atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Metabolic syndrome is a growing epidemic in the United States, and it's been known to have a prevalence of approximately 20% in the United States currently, and this increases with increasing age. The components of metabolic syndrome include hypertension, central obesity, insulin resistance, a decreased amount of high-density lipoprotein cholesterol, as well as hypertriglyceridemia. The first component, component of metabolic syndrome we discussed was central obesity. Now an increased BMI as well as an increased weight circumference have both been associated with an increased risk of atrial fibrillation. And in fact, the data suggests that obese individuals actually have a 49% increased risk of atrial fibrillation development with a 4% increased risk per one unit of BMI increase when compared to individuals with normal BMIs. Elevated systolic uh, blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, as well as a pulse pressure have also been associated with an increased risk in the development of atrial fibrillation. Now the data suggests that a systolic blood pressure less than 129 millimeters of mercury may be associated with the least amount of risk of developing atrial fibrillation. Additionally, uh, a diastolic blood pressure less than 80 Preferably less than 65 appears to be associated with the smallest risk of developing atrial fibrillation. Now, strict glucose control among patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus uh, may decrease the risk of atrial fibrillation. And in fact, the data suggests that patients with atrial fibrillation as well as type 2 diabetes mellitus may actually increase the risk of cardiovascular mortality. There is evidence to suggest that in addition to strict glucose control, the duration of persistent uncontrolled uh, glucose in the blood may also play a role in the development of atrial fibrillation. However, it's very important to remember um, that all this data is currently controversial and is still the subject of continued debate among experts. Finally, Although still controversial, there is evidence to suggest that low levels of HDL, and we're talking about levels less than 35 milligrams per deciliter, may actually be associated with an increased risk of atrial fibrillation. A Japanese study actually showed that women had a higher risk of atrial fibrillation, uh, and this is anywhere from 20 to 30 percent increased risk of atrial fibrillation, with each 10 percent decrease in high density uh, lipoprotein cholesterol. And while it may be important to advise patients with low HDL cholesterol to engage in lifestyle modifications, it is very important to remember that there is no strong evidence to support this recommendation. Finally, it's very important to realize uh, that there is no strong evidence linking triglycerides or uh, low-density lipoprotein cholesterol to the risk of developing atrial fibrillation.
Now, obstructive sleep apnea is a common health concern, very widely spread, and is a known uh, risk factor for atrial fibrillation that is actually independent of hypertension, BMI, and other cardiovascular disease. In fact, a recent study showed that patients with severe forms of obstructive sleep apnea um, and atrial fibrillation are less likely to respond to antiarrhythmic drug therapy. And in fact, these patients are also have a higher risk of refer recurrence of atrial fibrillation after pulmonary vein isolation. Fortunately, there is evidence to suggest that patients with obstructive sleep apnea that are actually treated with continuous positive airway pressure have a, a lower risk of recurrence of atrial fibrillation after uh, cardioversion or electrocardioversion when compared to untreated patients. And in fact, it showed the data suggests that these patients' risk actually returns to that approximately of that of the control group. Now, for several decades, in fact, since the late 70s, alcohol consumption has been uh, considered a potential cause of atrial fibrillation. And this was first described by Eidinger in 1978, and it was described as the holiday heart syndrome. Now, it should be noted that this relationship between alcohol and atrial fibrillation is dose-dependent, with the highest risk present in, pati in patients or individuals that consume over 36 grams of alcohol per day, which is roughly approximately three drinks per day. Now, it would seem prudent to recommend only consuming low doses of alcohol. And when we say low doses of alcohol, what we're suggesting possibly one to two drinks of alcohol per day in larger individuals, one drink of alcohol per day in, in smaller individuals, and in fact, in patients that have the highest risk of atrial fibrillation, well below one drink per day. Now, atrial fibrillation is the most common cardiac arrhythmia among athletes. In fact, there have been multiple small studies that have, that have demonstrated a relationship between vigorous physical activity related to either endurance sports or occupational activities and an increased risk of atrial fibrillation. And in fact, several of my co-authors have recently reported the potential cardiotoxicity of extreme levels of endurance exercise. And this was published in the June 2012 uh, edition of the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Now, it's very common for individuals with cardiac arrhythmias to be uh, advised to avoid caffeine-containing products such as tea and coffee. However, there is a large amount of evidence to suggest that drinking moderate amounts of caffeine-containing products such as tea or coffee do not cause atrial fibrillation and may actually decrease the occurrence of atrial fibrillation. Now recently, in this past decade, there has been a growing interest in the role of vitamin D. Now vitamin D uh, deficiency has been linked to various cardiovascular disease processes such as hypertension, diabetes mellitus, myocardial infarction, as well as uh, CVAs or stroke. Now, it should be noted that recent evidence has failed to, to demonstrate any correlation uh, between vitamin D deficiency and the risk of development of atrial fibrillation. However, there is evidence from the Intermountain Study in Utah that suggests uh, a correlation between excessive amounts of vitamin D in the blood, namely greater than 100 nanograms per milliliter, and atrial fibrillation development. Now, recent studies have also shown that N3 polyunsaturated fatty acids, or fish oil, most commonly known, uh, may be effective in the prevention of atrial fibrillation. Now, while some studies have shown anywhere but from a 20 to 30 percent decrease in atrial fibrillation risk when consuming N3 polyunsaturated fatty acids, there have been many studies that have shown no correlation. Now, it's important to note that the prescription medication omega-3 acid ethyl esters, better known as Lavaza, has recently changed their safety labeling to a mild warning about the drug. And this says that consuming omega-3 acid ethyl esters may actually increase the frequency of atrial fibrillation, especially during the first few months of the drug use. So, some of the take-home points to consider. Number one. A proper understanding of the risk factors associated with atrial fibrillation development may actually help cardiologists as well as primary care physicians initiate prime, uh, preventive strategies and thereby potentially decrease the risk of atrial fibrillation. Number two, patients with metabolic syndrome have demonstrated a higher risk of the development of atrial fibrillation. Number three, Patients with severe obstructive sleep apnea and atrial fibrillation have shown an increased risk of cardiovascular mortality and have shown a decreased response to antiarrhythmic drug therapy.
as well as an increased recurrence of atrial fibrillation after electrocardioversion or pulmonary vein isolation. Number four, the relationship between alcohol and atrial fibrillation is dose dependent, with the highest risk in patients or individuals consuming over 36 grams of alcohol per day, which is roughly about three uh, drinks per day. Number five, extreme exercise has been linked to cardiotoxicity, and this includes an increased risk of atrial fibrillation development. Number six, excessive vitamin D, D may be associated with an increased risk of atrial fibrillation. However, further studies are necessary uh, to confirm this. And number seven, the role of N3 polyunsaturated fatty acids in the setting of atrial fibrillation is still very controversial. While some studies have shown uh, an, incidence, an increased incidence of atrial fibrillation development, other studies have shown a lower risk of atrial fibrillation development. In conclusion, over the years, from the time of Maimonides and Eitinger, it seems that our understanding of the risk factors of atrial fibrillation have developed and advanced substantially. However, it seems intuitive that a better understanding of the risk factors from H for atrial fibrillations would better prepare the medical professionals and also prevent atrial fibrillation. This area of, research, of, of medicine is a hotbed for research currently. More research on this would better help the medical community and would thereby potentially decrease the morbidity and mortality associated with this condition. Thank you very much for your time. We hope you benefited from this presentation based on the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you're interested in more information about Mayo Clinic Proceedings, visit our website at www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you will find additional videos on our YouTube channel, and you can follow us on Twitter. For more information on healthcare at Mayo Clinic, please visit www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.